Welcome to the Business and Society series at the Stephen M. Ross School of Business. I'm your host, Michael Gardner. I'm a BBA alum, Google sales manager, and active contributor to diversity, equity, and inclusion. This year, we're exploring the theme of race and business, and I'm excited to welcome Laura Morgan Roberts and Tony Mayo, who are authors and co-editors of the volume Race, Work, and Leadership, New Perspectives on the Black Experience. Whether you're joining us from Ross, Darden, HBS, or elsewhere, thank you for participating in this important conversation. So, Laura and Tony, um, I have a number of questions to ask you, some of which have been inspired by pre-submitted audience questions. Um, folks in the audience, looks like there's over 100 of you thus far, I'm sure more will trickle in. Um, if additional questions arise for you throughout the conversation, please add them to the Q&A section in Zoom and upvote the ones that you are most interested in in um, at me asking. I'll try to save some time toward the end to ask some of the most popular questions. Laura and Tony, does that work for you? Sounds okay. great. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, let's dive right in. So Laura, we're gonna start with you. Let's start by framing the problem. What does it mean to be black in corporate America today? And how is that experience different from others? Being Black in corporate America today is uh, to stand at the crossroads of a number of challenges and opportunities. Now, some of those challenges and opportunities are shared with other groups. We can generalize beyond the Black experience. And as I begin to talk about these challenges and opportunities, there are points in time where you might say, so do I, or so do we, right? But what's unique about the Black experience is, as I said, standing at the crossroads crossroads or the intersections of these different dynamics. So I'm going to use four popular phrases that we've heard a lot about in, uh, especially in 2020, uh, diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice, and give you a preview of the Black experience in corporate America as it relates to each of those. So as it relates to diversity, there are questions around representation or in particular, the asymmetry or the imbalance in representation. By that, we're talking about Black workers being overrepresented at the lowest levels of organization, having the least paying lowest status jobs within industries and sectors, conversely being underrepresented at the most senior levels of the organization. We present these data in our book uh, so you can see across industries and sectors, there's that kind of overrepresentation, underrepresentation pattern that plays out. But we also wanted to understand what's beneath the numbers, because I think what we'll talk about today is how do we get beneath the numbers to address some of the dynamics that are in place in organizations that are causing this pattern in representation. And there, uh, we will talk about access, authenticity, advancement and authority or contested authority. So with access and authenticity, this is the inclusion conversation. It's okay, so maybe you've gotten the job, maybe you have the title, maybe you have the position, but do you have full access to the social networks when the organization, are you free to truly bring your whole self all aspects of your cultural heritage background experience in the organization, or do you feel constrained? The research shows that Black professionals feel constrained in those ways. It's challenging to build high quality connections, and it's challenging to bring their full selves to work because of the negative stigmas that are associated with race and being Black. Now, the last pieces of the puzzle are around equity and justice. And this is when we take a sharper lens on the leadership experience. So from an equity standpoint, you would presume that people who put in the same amount of work would have access to the same amount of benefits. That would be equitable. You would also assume that people who have made the same kinds of mistakes would be penalized to the same extent, right? That would be equity as well. Well, with Black people working in corporate America, they often um, find themselves in situations in which they're putting forth great effort not receiving the same kinds of returns or rewards. People are less likely to bet on their potential. They're less likely to advance to more senior positions of leadership. 
and their mistakes are penalized more heavily. Uh, so this brings us to the last piece, which is justice, because justice really kicked off a lot of the public conversation in June 2020. And people felt, well, this was about George Floyd not receiving justice and Breonna Taylor not receiving justice and so many others not receiving justice against violent offenses that took their lives and you know negatively impacted their families and communities. Well, guess what? Those same experiences of injustice are taking place in our organizations today. And so leaders now have to address that head on as well. How do we make sure that people who are not being treated fairly, who are not having the access, who aren't being welcomed, get greater opportunities so that they can thrive and flourish in their organizations as well? Sounds like we have a lot to do. Um, let's, like you said, let's go deeper than, than the numbers. Why has this, I mean, race is nothing new in, in this country. Um, why do you think this problem has persisted for so long? Well, there are a couple of ways to think about that. Um, let's just give the, the most neutral of explanations on that. Um, we simply stopped talking about it it fell off the radar. Now that explanation lacks some agency. Um, I would say that we actually have made choices, decided strategic choices about not focusing on race and focusing on some other aspects of diversity, inclusion, positive thriving in organizations that feel a little more palatable. But those choices have been made over years and years and years when people decide, well, you know, maybe we should make sure that we open up this program to everybody and not just focus on the unique challenges or issues that Black people are facing, because then it'll have a broader appeal and people will be more receptive. So you may have thought that it was the best strategic move, but, you know, the, the, the uh, side effect of doing that was we over time have paid less and less attention to racial equity and, and um, justice in our organizations. Even that though is um, a conversation about what's happened in the last 30 to 40 years, You know how we've sort of drifted in and out of this work on race. If we step back and look at 100 years of histories of, of labor exploitation, Michael, the other piece that you know, Tony and I brought into our work is the origin of Black labor, African descended labor in the Americas. And that was an inequitable, unjust, dehumanizing arrangement of bondage. And so you say, well, how do you undo that? You know, it's really only been 50 years when we're talking about a 400 year history of uh, lack of access, lack of freedom, lack of opportunity um, to, to grow, to thrive in life, in community, much less in the workplace. Yeah, I think, I think folks have heard that, that a bit. Connect, connect those dots for the, for the audience between you know, slavery, which happened hundreds of years ago and how that is impacting the reality that we're seeing today. Well, let's see, in some very subtle ways, um, we still have power dynamics that are in just influencing or shaping our belief systems about who's in power, who's in charge, and who's, who's not. So when I walk into a classroom on the first day and I'm leaving the University of Michigan and with my PhD in organizational psychology, where I've been bolstered up by the Ross School and I'm carrying with me the pride of my ancestry. I'm carrying the, the, the knowledge that, you know, my grandmother I graduated from the University of Michigan in the late 1930s when she as an African-American woman could not live on campus. My uncle had gotten a PhD in psychology in the early 70s after undergrad at Harvard. My mom had graduated from Wellesley, right? So I'm walking in with all of this internal, you know, self-regard plus some pedigree. I got some degrees, I got some connections, I have some links. The students look at the front of the classroom and they're like, you're my lead professor. 
wait a minute. I had one student one day who said to me, I'm just trying to figure out what I did wrong because you're standing in front of the classroom and I'm the one taking the class. So when you say, how does, how do you know, these multiple generations play out? Well, one, you know, the lineage I laid out for you, there's few and far between in terms of the number of black people who have that legacy of higher education alone, who then would help to equip them um, to have the kind of opportunities that I was fortunate to have. So I, I, it's always important for me to own and acknowledge that piece. But the, also the legacy of enslavement is that we still subtly have these power dynamics. When we think leadership, we think white male. When we think criminal or deviant or disruptor or angry black woman, someone who's agitated or needs to be controlled, you know, we're using racialized beliefs that still affect that. That's how Amy Cooper could call the police on Christian Cooper in Central Park earlier this year. You know, not, not because it, he, it was an actual arrangement of enslavement, but because that legacy of how we see ourselves and our power dynamic, it still plays out. Got it. Tony, anything you want to add? Well, I mean, the obvious, like when I walk into a classroom, um, I have the instant credibility. I have legitimacy. I don't have to actually have to work towards that. So I'm working from that. And then what I do, maybe that will lessen over time based on their experience of me, but I don't have to earn it. Uh, where Laura has to walk in and she has to earn it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not a level playing field. It hasn't been, and it still isn't. Because we have these conscious and unconscious biases about the way in which we look at people and ascribe certain characteristics to them, certain behaviors, certain um, uh, uh, aspects of credibility uh, that, um, that make it much more difficult uh, for certain individuals than others. Yeah. When I think back, you know, six, seven years ago, when um, these types of conversations started to become more mainstream as various companies began to release their um, workforce representation data publicly, um, conscious and unconscious bias were some of the first topics that were explored. Um, today, we've learned a lot over the last, you know, six or seven years. Um, so we've talked a bit about what the problem is, why it exists. Uh, let's spend a little bit of time, Tony, on what, what good looks like. So yeah. what can you share about, you know, what has been learned over the past um, six to seven years and in informing what an inclusive organization works looks like and what, uh, what initiatives or processes have been most effective in creating systemic equality in the workplace? Yeah. So th there are two things that we're, we're talking about here. One is, was, is about authenticity and the other is really about advancement. And, and so those are the issues of inclusion and equity, right? And so when we think about authenticity, are you stepping, so there's one thing about the pipeline and that's diversity, getting people in the door, right? Uh, and so that's a particular issue. But then when you're in the organization, do you have the scaffolding? Do you have the support system? Do you have the structure to make it uh, an environment where people can uh, bring their full selves to work? And as Laura mentioned, what we saw in our research is that many, um, uh, black executives uh, take on these facades of conformity. And so you see some organizations when you think about diversity, in fact, there's a chapter in the book about you know, managing, uh, it's about really managing diversity, not about managing blackness. When you're managing blackness, you're expecting the black executive to fit the prototypical white way of, of working as opposed to creating an environment where you're really trying to harness that diversity uh, of perspective and thought uh, in the organization. And so part of it is this inclusive environment is moving beyond just the business case for diversity. We've heard a lot about that and there's lots of documents about what's the ROI on this. Uh, let's move beyond that. And I think this year, at least the conversation has moved to more towards the moral and the social justice cause uh, for diversity about access and opportunity. But it starts at the top with a commitment uh, to creating a psychologically safe environment where I can be authentic uh, that means that I'm not the one always, I, if I was a black executive, sorry, I'm talking that way, but if, if, so if I'm coming in, you know, the burden is not on me, but it's on the broader organization to uh, embrace who I am as an individual, if, if I'm an underrepresented individual within the organization. So part of it is that, and then part of it is being uh, attuned to uh, the ways in which certain individuals in the organization are given opportunities and are giving developmental feedback and coaching. So what we do know from the research is that women, people of color get the least amount of feedback and coaching and development in organizations. 
And sometimes that comes from a place of, of ill-informed well-meaning that I'm not gonna be critical. I'm not gonna you know, be uh, judgmental of somebody's performance who's different than me if I'm a white executive like myself because I don't wanna be viewed as sexist or racist. So I'm not gonna say anything. So if I say nothing, then you know I'm not gonna make a mistake. But by saying nothing, I'm not giving that individual the opportunity to grow and develop where to my white colleague, my white counterpart, I'm giving them uh, him or her that opportunity. And so at the end of the day, uh, when I'm doing evaluations about promotions and opportunities, uh, one set of individuals has a leg up over the other because I'm not giving them those opportunities. That's what it means about having an organization that has uh, uh, a focus on inclusion, on access and on op opportunity. We do know also from our research that uh, underrepresented minorities are least likely to get uh, uh, placed in positions of general and line management experience. The thing that's interesting is they are equally likely to get visible um, positions, but do those visible positions in the organization, which the organization gets credit, uh, do those visible positions actually translate into uh, a significant line management experience? And does that uh, is that part of the career trajectory uh, for that particular individual in the organization? So taking uh, a step back, measuring your, uh, your diversity and inclusion numbers, but also looking at how are you thinking about um, the career path, the career ladders of individuals in the organization? Uh, what are, and, and so this goes back to earlier, we talked about biases. So I think a lot of organizations have focused on this notion of unconscious bias, that's great. So, uh, you know, you raise awareness, but then you've got to like move to action. And I think what a lot of organizations do is they stop at awareness and then we say, oh, we're all biased. Okay, you know, um, hmm, that's, that's tough. What do we do next? And so I think it's what do we do next is the important part that we need to focus on. Got it. I want to key in on a couple of things that, that you said, one of which is success. Another is, you didn't use this exact word, but um, accountability. You talked about commitment from the top. So. In regards to success, um, how would you say organizations should be measuring success? And does it answer vary based on size of the company at all? Yeah, I don't think, it, I mean, the size of the company, I think these are important issues. And regardless, I mean, uh, you should be focusing on um, accessing the broadest uh, level of talent. That's going to help your organization overall. You're missing out on opportunities if you're not doing that. So I think that that doesn't necessarily uh, factor too much into the equation from my perspective. In terms of measures of success, it's looking at um, who are you considering for promotion? What, are the, what is the track record? Uh, who's coming in the door? Where are they on the career ladder? There's lots of research about stalls on the ladder. There's lots of research about women and people of color getting um, glass cliff experiences. So the, which you know, we mean that this is a, this is a situation that's going to go off the cliff anyway. So, you know, why don't I, uh, you know, give it to, to somebody, uh, a woman or a person of color, maybe I get credit for that. It's going to go bad anyway. So it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, you know, uh, and so looking at your pattern of uh, who's being considered for opportunities, looking at your pattern for coaching, looking at your overall diversity numbers, those are all measures of success. Are you actually measuring um, your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion? You can measure it. We, we do know that people follow what is being measured. So looking at those measurements, being transparent about that, being open about that, widening the net uh, in terms of who you're considering for opportunities, thinking about both performance and potential, all of those are things that you can do to measure accountability and hold people uh, uh, to what they say they want to do. Got it. So before we move on, let's dig a little bit deeper into this idea of accountability. How do you think about accountability, especially among leaders who have not necessarily demonstrated a sustained commitment to creating a more inclusive organization? Yeah, so one of the, one of the big things that we've heard from a number of uh, Black executives that we uh, interview through this research is that sponsorship and mentorship are critically important. Uh, in, in fact, more, uh, more so organic mentorship is more important. So we do know that underrepresented individuals within an organization are more likely to be put into formal mentoring programs. Those are well-intentioned programs by organization, but it means maybe you meet once a month, you talk about the culture, uh, you get a little bit of advice, but it doesn't. you don't necessarily have any skin in the game if you're the mentor. What really happens, it will really 
uh, sets organizations apart and individuals, um, underrepresented individuals on their career trajectory is if they have a sponsor, somebody who has their back, who, you know, if somebody has gonna have an inevitable slip up, we all do, uh, am I gonna uh, have your back for that? Am I gonna uh, put you up for promotion? Am I going to sponsor you? Am I gonna put myself forward um, as somebody who is willing to back you? We know that's critically important. And who are those people who are in the senior management position? It's mostly people who look like me, right? Uh, and so it's and so you have to think about like you have a goal, you have a responsibility. I, I know a lot of individuals I talk to, to say, look, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You know, I'm an older white guy. I'm not sure. I'm sort of clumsy with this sort of thing. Well, hey, you could be a sponsor. You can be a champion. You can uh, you can ask the questions in the organization about what we're doing. I mean, you have a sense of agency. It's not like you don't have agency. You do have agency. Uh, and you can, if you really want to do something about, sorry, I'm going off a little bit. You can, you can uh, do something uh, about it. And so, uh, so I encourage uh, executives. One of the things that we talked about, you know, we were, we were talking to successful African-American women. Uh, one of the interviewees, you know, she, uh, we asked about mentors and she closed her eyes and she said, and then she opened them and she was horrified. And she said, oh my God, you know, when I closed my eyes and thought about my mentor, I, yeah, I just saw a bunch of old white men. Uh, and because for her, those were the people who were in positions of power and it, and um, some of them stepped up and helped her along her path and uh, she was uh, immensely grateful for it. So instead of putting the onus on the individual in the organization to sort of be the perfect protege and to be somebody that you want to be mentor, that people want to mentor, you can take a more proactive role. I'm going to challenge you a bit on this um, yes. <laughs> because what, just based on some things that you said, you said that white people are the folks who are primarily in positions of leadership and power. Mm -hmm. uh, folks are less likely to give critical coaching and feedback to those who hold different identities than them. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it comes to sponsorship, that sounds like a choice essentially, like whether or not you choose to engage with, with someone yeah. who, is, who holds a different set of identities and is more junior than you. Yeah. Yeah. So is there evidence that systemic sponsorship can be created? And is there other ways to encourage accountability without just relying on this idea of whether or not someone decides to? Support? Yeah, I mean, so, so organizations can mandate it, you know, but you have to be, you have to be careful about what what does that translate into sort of a check the box type of thing that I want to do. So you want to create a context where people want to do this, that they, so I, so I get what you're saying. So yeah, you don't want to put the onus on the individual and based on everything I've said, their likelihood to do it is pretty low. I think that's what you're getting at, Michael. Um, and so, uh, so I think that, you know, can organizations create context that are supportive of that? Yes. Can they measure that? Yes. Can they uh, ask people to report on that? Yes. They can do all of those things um, uh, to 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 ensure a greater likelihood that this will occur. If I could jump in here just a bit, just uh, to tag on, I think even when you've got the will, you don't necessarily have the skill. So part of the work I've been doing over the past few months um, has been partnering with firms who are designing these sponsorship programs and helping them to develop a set of experiences that would prepare the sponsor and the sponsee for building a high quality connection across dimensions of difference. Because we have been taught that talking about race is taboo. It's you know not something that is polite and we definitely are not used to doing it across our racial groups, across our racial categories. So, you know, one of the, the biggest learning experiences for me in the collaboration with Tony was just seeing just how far we could go when he and I could sit down and have candid conversations, you know, in private, but also in public about these kinds of issues. But most of the people who are coming into these sponsorship programs and roles do not know what to do with their identities in the context of those relationships. And so that explains a lot about why they tend to fall apart. You're just not making that authentic connection. And, and that's part of the, um, the hard work that we have to do. Got it. So equip sponsors, equip sponsees, 
um, to make sure that the relationships are actually effective and authentic. And normalize the conversations about race, right? And not make them so, uh, you know, uh, under a spotlight and so uh, anxiety provoking, you know, and as senior leaders, you can do that. You can set the model, you can do, you can have book clubs, you can have conversations, you can, you can initiate that uh, as opposed to, you know, when you have to have it and, and you're thinking, oh, you know, I don't want to fall in any uh, trap or landmine or, or be viewed in a particular way because we're all concerned about our identity. We're all, we want to be liked, right? We want to be accepted. We want to feel like we're doing the right thing. And so sometimes, you know, just like we don't give feedback, we step away from these relationships because well, we don't know how to handle it. So Tony, you're saying a dedicated speaker series? Isn't <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, this, this is the food for thought. This is the uh, fodder. But uh, then you've got to go back and have some discussion groups where people tell their own stories. I mean, you know, as we, the three of us here, make ourselves vulnerable in some ways to engage in this conversation. And, you know, I try to be intentional in these forums now to share a little bit about my story, a little bit about my background, a little bit about my anxieties, just to model all that so then when people go back and have their own conversations you know it's not based on some myth or you know, mm -hmm. but that the, it, it really can be much more grounded in um getting yeah. to know who who we are and how our identities help to shape who we are and I can tell you, like when Laura approached me to be on this project to work with her, I said, look, I'll do a chapter, but that's that's it. And she's like, no, we need to collaborate. I'm like, I'm not the right person. Uh, and so it, it you know, we, we went through that whole process ourselves of uh, of coming to a, a partnership in, in, in a way that dealt with my own anxieties about it. So it's a really good segue to my last question before we open it up to questions from from the audience. Um, this is to both of you. Um, some of the pre-submitted questions had this, this theme, whether it's because of their title, their tenure, their country of origin, a certain set of identities that they may hold. Many people feel powerless on their ability to create a more inclusive workplace, especially when it comes to race in this country. What would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, I say it's simplistic and it's uh, sophisticated. Okay, so on the simplistic side, you start by talking about it. Just have the conversations, keep bringing it up. You know, everybody was talking, 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 and now we can already see we're starting to sort of revert back, get more quiet about this again. So we've got to keep it front and center in order to be able to do the work, got to keep the fire burning on this, um, and not let it, not let our interest and our attention wane. I mean, it is, it's sophisticated in that it involves um, having that internal consistency and accountability that um, you and Tony were, you know, discussing, Michael, like that's an important part, like the infrastructure really has to be aligned in order to support it. Um, the organizational culture has to shift in a way that prioritizes these issues of diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice. It just has to become core to the identity of the firm, not just one or two people, not just the chief diversity officer, but it really has to be embedded into the fabric of the way the organization sees itself and how it can do that. Now, any individual is a culture carrier. So this is where we come into play. You know, culture is not what somebody mandates. Culture is what we live and breathe and what we do. Do on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we're acknowledging, when we're affirming, when we're, you know, calling, uh, calling people into conversation about racial microaggressions, about stereotypical comments, about making fun of people's names, about making, you know, jokes about various communities, and you know, the the whole range of things. Um, when you lo you know more and you know better, you do better. You know, as as my Angelou said. So do better. You know, that, those are simple things you can do to start to chip away at this broad systemic change. The last thing I want to put out there is that it does involve a wide range of stakeholders. And please understand that consumers and people in the community and the environment have an incredible amount of power and voice. Look at the number of brands that made changes and commitments over a what three four week period because there were voices from all over the world who said we want 
you to live and act in more responsible ways when it comes to racial justice. So whether you're an insider or you see yourself as an outsider, you're still a stakeholder. And so you can still help to mobilize change. Yeah, the only things that I would add is that, you know, we, we talked about you need to understand your biases, so definitely understand that, but move beyond awareness to your own sense of self-education and action. You know, don't rely on others to educate you necessarily about what the issues are. You know, you can take that, you can own that uh, on yourself. You can also reverse mentor in, uh, on issues of racial justice, right? You can ask questions, you can inquire, um, you know, particularly the younger generation, you, you can take that on. And as, as Laura said, you can call call out overt and subtle forms of uh, racism uh, in the organization. But this all requires you to sort of be vulnerable yourself, uh, to, to adopt a learning mindset, and to want to contribute to that. So, so I always talk to my students, I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do? I, I don't have any agency. Well, you have agency with your cohorts of individuals that you have, and you can have agency in terms of the questions that you ask of the senior leaders in the organization about how they're thinking about these issues. What would you say to black employees? To black employees, um, Tony and I closed out our Harvard Business Review Big Idea series on advancing black leaders a, a year ago in November 2019 with a piece directly um, speaking to black employees and it's about the power of self-affirmation and remaining grounded in yourself, in your sense of self in ways that allow you to continue to stretch and grow and change over time, you know, to take the kinds of risks and build relationships, but also to fortify yourself against the different kinds of microaggressions. So, you know, and it's it does start with your mindset and um, really having the belief in our own potential to grow and become, uh, to draw on the core of who we are and the experiences that we've had, to look at our collective history through the lens of resilience and you know, to draw strength from that. Um, and then reach out and start building those connections that can help us to grow and have the kind of impact that we seek over time. Tony. Uh, I think Laura said it well. The only thing that I would add that that um, Black executives has told us is to find their community of support as well uh, in the organization. You know, and we need that. We all need that, and so rely on those uh, individuals. Okay. All right. Let's transition. Thank you. Let's transition to a few questions in these final few minutes from from the audience. Um, I'm going to try to pick a couple of different ones related to that segue pretty well. Um, there was a you all just spoke about this idea of um, ownership, self-affirmation, et cetera. One person asked, many DEI-focused groups, so diversity, equity, and inclusion-focused groups in my organization are led and comprised of people of color, including myself. How do we ensure that the responsibility of teaching others and making changes doesn't primarily fall on the people being oppressed? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I... Um... This is always an interesting question, right? Because I think each individual has to um, do their own, what I call contribution calculus in this work. Um, you've got to ask yourself a series of really important questions. Uh, what are my capabilities here? Like, what do I have to bring to the table? If I have something of value to offer in this space, then, you know, that, that may make it more of, of a meaningful venture and engagement for me. Um, a second is commitment. Do I care? I mean, I remember once I heard Oprah Winfrey speak about Stevie Wonder asking her to make a charitable contribution or a philanthropic donation. She said, you know what, Stevie, I'm going to have to say no. And she said, it's not because I don't have the money, because we know I do. But it's, I can't care about everything. So even within this massive sphere of DEI initiatives, there may be a specific project or program or initiative or area of the organization or you know team that you're particularly interested in. Allow yourself to focus in on that and be deeply committed to that. Because the last important piece of this is capacity. And 
people can derail their careers when they're pouring in so much time and energy and then they have limited capacity available to do some of the other career differentiating or growth opportunities that are available. Um, I can't offer a tremendous amount around the rewards piece of this work because the, the data is a little bit sobering on this respect. It does suggest that white men um, are viewed more favorably when they're view taking on these initiatives. And sometimes people of color and even women can be penalized for taking on these initiatives. So again, you really have to feel like this is going to be your zone of commitment to make a valuable contribution. And the last thing I do, I have stopped taking on other people's emotions. I just don't do it anymore. Other people have to do their emotional work. I have to do my emotional work, but I cannot be a container for other people's anxiety, guilt, or shame about what has happened, you know, as they become more aware of racial injustice. We can talk, we can share, but we've, I have to do my emotional work and they have to do their emotional work. The only thing that I would add there too is if you are, whether you're in an official uh, DEI role or not, if you're an underrepresented individual in the organization, you're probably going to be tapped to take on that role or to represent uh, that role in the organization. And what we do know, and this gets to the whole feedback, is that you're taking that on in addition to the other work that you're doing. And so in, 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 at the end of the day, you're being evaluated on the core job, not necessarily the DEI work, even though um, you're doing that, right? And so you're doing double duty there. And so these are opportunities to renegotiate where organizations can step up and give the same uh, weight, the same legitimacy, the same credibility to this DEI work. What I find is they don't, right? They expect you to do that and they expect you to do your job and have your numbers, right? You're going to have to have the same numbers as everybody else. Uh, you know, if you have a level of agency, if you can negotiate that, yeah, you want me to do this? then okay, my numbers are 80% of everybody else's, right? Because I'm gonna be spending 20% of my time on this or whatever there can be, uh, but there has to be, this is what I'm talking to organizations about. Like you're putting these burdens uh, on individuals and you're expecting a double duty and that's not a fair uh, and level playing field. Okay, well, we're almost at the end. So I'm gonna bundle the last three questions into one through some feet. Um, <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> and I think the, the underlying spirit of the last three questions is kind of about um, what is going to drive long-term change. Um, there's a question about the um, potential effectiveness of the Crown Act, if that becomes federal law. There's a question about um, how to uh, measure long-term success and ROI um, instead of just reactive reactive efforts to you know, nationwide news cycles. And there's a question about, about if the introduction and expansion of these programs are actually shifting perspectives around um, race in a healthy or unhealthy way. Um, so how do you, when you think about the long, what's going to really drive long-term sustainable change and what has worked thus far, um, what, what gives you hope? Um, what gives me hope in sustainable change is looking at uh, systems level approaches. It gives me hope that we're now talking not just about unconscious bias, but about systemic racism and structural inequality. You know, it gives me hope through tears that we can have candid conversations about health inequalities and about injustices in our health care, that we can talk about wage inequality and essential workers, that when we've had this moment of awakening around the pandemic and the vulnerability of Black lives in so many different ways, um, business leaders are weighing in on that, policymakers and legislators are weighing in on that, um, and economic leaders are also weighing in on that. Uh, I think when we start to work together across those systems, then we will have more viable communities. And as our communities become more viable, so will our organizations. As long as we're just trying to answer the question of, oh, how can I and company A get the best talent of this particular profile or background, we're not gonna solve the underlying issues. Mm. 
Yeah, I've been encouraged about the the reckoning that's happened. Uh, I concerned about the sustainability, right? Uh, and so uh, that is about the pressure to keep this uh, front and center uh, at the senior level. And I see organizations trying to do that. There's a group of you know tech CEOs in Silicon Valley that are working on this. Keep that going. You know, so we need to see more instances of that where this uh, is front and center. The other thing that I think I've been heartened about this. Uh, year is really the focus on the black experience, right? You know, when, when Laura started and we talked about this, uh, well-meaning organizations had a pretty big tent for diversity. Everything was, not everything, but there was a lot of things that can be uh, under the diversity umbrella. And when you do that, um, as Laura likes to say, I'll quote you here while you're live, you know, we erase race in the conversation, right? When we, when we sort of, uh, um, you know, wash over what is diverse uh, and what is real diversity. And so uh, I think there's a greater willingness to have those most difficult conversations and uh, sustaining that at the senior level. Uh, and as uh, you know, the younger generation, you, know, you have a role and responsibility to keep those conversations alive. And, and uh, I have uh, hope and faith in that. Great, well, with that, Laura, Tony, thank you for such an engaging discussion and such fresh perspective. Um, to, to the audience, I imagine there are some of you who, are, who have been inspired to take action, and I imagine there are others who want to dig a bit deeper first. Um, in either case, um, I'll take some of the things that, that Laura and Tony encouraged and, and share those with you as, as next steps. Um, so first, I would encourage everyone to carve out some, some quiet time to reflect on what you heard today. Um, second, Buy the book if you haven't already done so. Um, again, it's called Race, Work, and, and Leadership. Um, there's a lot of different perspectives in there that are, that are worth um, incorporating into your own worldview. Um, and then finally, I would encourage everyone to take choose one specific action that you can take to stay engaged with your own journey toward creating a more inclusive environment and society. And, and of course, look out for future events as part of this Business and Society series. Um, and so other than that, thank you again, Laura and Tony, and everyone enjoy your weekend. Yeah.